welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis. I'm the apostle for the restoration of the original first century faith. And in this part number six of Revelation Simplified, we want to talk about the time of Jacob's trouble, including the two witnesses. So to help people stay oriented, we've been talking about the parable of the pregnant bride. In earlier slide sets, we saw how the seals represent a bride's growing burden. We also talked in the last slide set about trumpets one through six and how they correspond to the bride's labor contractions. So in this slide set, we're still talking about events prior to trumpet seven. We're also gonna to touch briefly on the seven thunders, which correspond to the bride's cries of pain. So if we go then to the simplified version of the timeline, again, the seven seals, the second line down, the seven seals correspond to the bride's growing burden over the past almost 2,000 years now and the releasing of the horse forces and how they marshal the armies of the world uh, into their end time positions to get ready for the final cataclysm and the tribulation. At seal five, it represents when the dead cry out for justice. We've been saying that this represents 9-11 and it may represent that. Uh, there was also a thought that it may have begun as early as 1979 with the events of the Iran hostage crisis. So we are presently waiting. We believe we have entered into seal six and the events take some time to play out. We're waiting on the sky to recede like a scroll. And when this takes place, then we know that every mountain and every island is going to be moved out of its place. And this corresponds to the rise of a new world order government, uh, quite possibly with 10 super nations. Then we'll also see uh, chapter seven is an inset chapter uh, and it corresponds to the sealing of the 144,000 whom we know are sealed uh, at least through trumpet five, possibly also through trumpet six. We know that we'll talk later about how we believe that they get harvested at some point during the tribulation, but that there's nothing to fear because when we are sealed and we're in him, we know where we're going and we know that we have an eternal reward in the heavens. So after these events, after the rise of the new world order, then there's a half an hour of silence in heaven, which takes place at or after seal seven. And this corresponds to 20 years and 10 months when the new world order effectively consolidates its power and also raises up a new generation of soldiers to carry out its will. Then we'll be talking in this slide set about how we know that the seven trumpets represent a seven year period of tribulation. We'll also be talking about how we know that the last three and a half years corresponds to the time of Jacob's trouble. And we believe that these events take place, uh, this is all building toward a crescendo at trumpet seven, which is a major watershed event. We're gonna see in later slides how uh, trumpet seven, that is when the great harlot Babylon is judged. And this opens the way then for the seven cups of wrath or the bowls of wrath to be poured out. And that of course, then leads to Armageddon. So we'll be giving a lot more detail in this particular set of slides. But again, what we're talking about in this slide set corresponds to events prior to trumpet seven. So effectively in between trumpets four and trumpet seven, we saw how trumpet Five is woe one, trumpet six is woe two, and then we'll see how trumpet seven corresponds to woe three. Here we're talking events prior to trumpet seven. We're gonna be talking about two inset chapters, and these don't necessarily take place at any particular point in the timeline, but we know that because of the placement of them, these are events that take place prior to trumpet seven. And we're gonna see how the three and a half years prior to trumpet seven corresponds to the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, so in Revelation chapter 10 and verse one, now this is an inset chapter. Uh, it's mentioned in the chronology after trumpet six, before trumpet seven. And it says, I saw still another mighty messenger coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. Now his description resembles the description of Yeshua that we're given in Revelation chapter one. Scholars are divided on whether it is Yeshua or not, but he resembles Yeshua. It says, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet were like pillars of fire. Verse two, 
and he had a little book open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea, which is symbolic of the people, and his left foot on the land, which is symbolic of the government. Now, when the little book is open, when a book is closed, we need someone else to interpret it for us. But at this point, the book is open. And so what this means is that we effectively, we the people, will be able to interpret and understand what's going on in this book for ourselves. Continuing on in verse 3. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, again, symbolic or similar to Yeshua. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Now, the seven thunders, we believe, correspond to the bride's cries of pain just prior to giving birth. Uh, So we know that these are some very severe tribulations, and they're so severe, but we don't even know what they are. We just know, again, that this is corresponding to the time of Jacob's trouble. And so this is why we believe the time of Jacob's trouble, which will be focused on the land of Israel, but not necessarily confined to the land of Israel, will be very severe. But there's nothing to fear because if we're sealed in him, we know we have a reward coming. We know we're in his favor. Verse 5. Then the messenger whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. Now, as we saw at seal five, the dead cried out for justice and they were given a white robe and told to wait a little bit longer until the number of their fellow servants and brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So here we're being told, and this is taking place just prior to trumpet seven, we're told that there shall be a delay no longer, referring, we believe, to trumpet seven. And in fact, here's trumpet seven in the narrative at verse 7. So Revelation 10 and verse 7. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh messenger, when he is about to sound, the mystery of Elohim would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. So up until this point, we've had mystery Babylon. So Babylon is operating, but it's a mystery because it looks like the fulfillment of Yeshua's kingdom. But so now this mystery is going to be destroyed at Trumpet 7. In future slide sets, we'll see how Babylon is judged at Trumpet 7. And then there will be mystery no longer. Verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book, which is open in the hand of the messenger, who stands on the sea and on the earth. Now, when a book is closed we can't understand it. We need someone to interpret it for us. This is why, so Yeshua opens the seven seals. But when a book is closed, we can't understand it. So we need someone to interpret it, but this book is open. So we'll be able to understand these things, at least we will at that time. Verse nine. So I went to the messenger and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the messenger's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. So this is when we understand the things that are going on in Scripture, it's very bitter for us because we understand that there's tribulation and judgment that's coming on the earth, and that's very bitter but it's very sweet to us to note and understand these revelations. And it's also sweet to us to understand that we have a place being prepared for us in the heavens. So verse 11, and he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So we're gonna shift gears here just for the moment. And we're gonna talk about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings that come together in an anti-Messiah's temple. So if we shift here to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 3, do not let anyone deceive you in any way, because that day will not come unless first comes the falling away. 
and the man of sin or the man of Torlessness, the Pope is revealed, the son of perdition, the one opposing and exalting himself over everything being called Elohim or object of worship, so as for him to sit in the temple of Elohim as Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. And we explain why this is the papacy in the Nazarene Israel study, but we know that already the Pope sits in a kind of a temple, in a kind of, a th- he sits on a throne in a kind of a temple in Vatican City. But it's long been known, long been understood that the Pope wants to move his throne to Jerusalem. And this is one of the major objectives of the Babylonian beast system. Now here are the grand rabbis talking about the Babylonian beast system. Here are the grand rabbis of both the Ashkenaz and the Sephardic sects representing the black horse. This is an older photo, but at the time this was the Ashkenaz grand rabbi Yona Metzger and also the Sephardic grand rabbi on the right, Shlomo Omar. And they're proposing a united nations of religion to the Pope. And as we saw in earlier slide sets, the Pope is the red horse. He's a representative of Esau, but he's still disguised as the white horse. He's disguised as white horse Ephraim. And we know that he wants to move his throne to the Temple Mount. Now, we need to understand there's more than one dynamic going on here. So uh, the papacy has his own dynamic, and we'll talk about that in future slide sets. But right now, if we take a look at a schematic of this, uh, of this dynamic, we've seen this slide before, we'll see it again. So here is, we have Black Horse Rabbinic Judah is in the head of gold of Babylon. And this is why the Jews have so much power and control and this sort of thing is because the rabbinical order is in the head of gold. Then we have Red Horse Esau or the papacy. Uh, He is basically inhabits the United Nations, which is democratically run or a a democratic, uh, it's it's based on democracy effectively. Uh, The representatives to the UN are not democratically elected, they're representatives but the UN favors democracy, and we know that democracy is Esau's system. So then we have the two feet of iron mixed with miry clay, and these represent the phase that we're in. And not that they're smaller than the two legs, but this is simply the phase that we're in. And we know that the Christian world, the Western foot would be the Western uh, Catholicism and also the Protestantism, and then the Eastern foot, so to speak, would be Orthodox Christianity and Russian Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Christianity. Now, both of these feet are infused with pockets of miry clay, again, representing cousin Ishmael and Islam. So it's very important to understand that Esau functions. Esau is the glue that's holding this whole thing together. And this is functioning on the democratic principle. Now, if we take a look at another and even more simplified schematic of this, this is a schematic of the, we might call the Babylonian beast system, and it's divided into two parts. But if we have the capstone, so to speak, of the New World Order, the Satanic Pyramid, uh, then we have the Black Horse Rabbis, uh, and also the uh, Synagogue of Satan, the Black Horse Money Power that's located in England in the inner city of London, the Rothschilds effectively, they are behind the United Nations and the United Religions Initiative. So they're the ones effectively pulling the strings. You pay no attention to the synagogue of Satan behind the curtain, so to speak. And then we see the Red Horse United Nations and the Red Horse United Religions Initiative. We'll talk about those in more detail. Uh, Those are both effectively centered around the papacy and around Rome. So, and then down below that, we have the white horse or the pink horse, we might call it, the pink horse Christians, and then also the green horse Ishmael and all other religions. And so this is one of the major goals is to establish this Babylonian new world order in two parts. So we'll have a a Babylonian United Nations to form a central government over all the world and a Babylonian United Religions Initiative to form one religion for all people. Now, because black controls red, 
the rabbis believe they're going to be able to maintain control over this thing. And what we're going to see is they're not going to be able to. At some point, the papacy is going to have his throne move to Jerusalem, and he's going to realize he does it, or, or maybe he already knows, but once he's already moved there, he's going to attempt to do away with the black horse because Esau hates Jacob. So Esau hates both Judah and Joseph. But this is Esau's power play as he's allowing the black horse to bring them to, to bring him and his throne to Jerusalem. And the rabbis are agreeing to this because in general, the black horse controls the red horse. We also know that the red horse favors the green horse because Esau intermarried with cousin Ishmael. We saw that in earlier slide sets. And right now, the white horse Ephraimites, the Josephites, and the Manassites, they submit to the red horse because they still have not broken free of the red horse completely. And this is one thing it's so important to understand. This is one of the major functions, and this is one of the reasons why we should rejoice, is the function, the purpose of this end time tribulation is to help Ephraim break free of this red horse system and go back to the form of governance and worship that's established in the pages of the renewed covenant and father willing we hope to make a completely new slides that we talk about that in the torah government study and father willing will also put this on video but this is one of the reasons why we will when we'll see that we are commanded to rejoice is this is where the remnant of ephraim and also the remnant of judah break free from this babylonian democratic or democratic republican system so continuing on to Revelation chapter 11, again, this is also an inset chapter. So this takes place prior to the events at Trumpet 7. It says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the messenger stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of Elohim, the altar, and those who worship there. Now we know that this is going to be the anti-Messiah's temple because these are events that take place just prior to Trumpet 7. He says, but leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it's been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the set-apart city underfoot for 42 months. And this corresponds to three and a half years in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, there's prophecy is not given to us so that we can know and predict the future perfectly accurately, but we do know that there will be attacks on the land of Israel. And since uh, it's quite possible uh, we know that there's going to be a lot of warfare and struggle uh, for israel specifically for jerusalem specifically for the temple mount at this time but one of the things we need to understand is why this is a seven-year period of tribulation so now we're going to shift gears a little bit we're going to go to daniel chapter 9 starting in verse 25 and this will help us understand why not only why it's a seven-year tribulation but why it's also a three and a half year time of Jacob's trouble. So Daniel 9 and verse 25 reads, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, that's Yeshua, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And we explain this, uh, the history of it in the Nazarene Israel study. I believe also in the Revelation study, but for sure in Nazarene Israel. So continuing on in verse 26, it says, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And this is when Yeshua died in the first century. This particular passage covers a span of 2000 years. It says, and the people of the prince who is to come, this is a reference to the Roman general Titus, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And it jumps ahead. The end of it shall be with a flood. We're going to show how that pertains to the cup judgments. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So we know that there's going to be a war during this particular period of time. And whether this war corresponds exactly to the time of Jacob's trouble, we know it also pertains to the cups and further even to Armageddon. So continuing in verse 27, it says, Then he, referring to the anti-Messiah, or the papacy, shall confirm a covenant with many for one Shavuot, or one seven. This refers to seven years. 
But in the middle of the seven, or in the middle of the seven years, meaning at three and a half year mark, he, the anti-Messiah, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And we believe that this is when the time of Jacob's trouble begins in earnest. So this is when the persecutions and the military events on the land will start up and we'll compare how that pertains to Luke 21 later in this slide set. Continuing in verse 27, it says, and on the wing of abominations, which may refer to the anti-Messiah's temple, shall be one who makes desolate, referring perhaps to the Islamic Mahdi, which is sort of an Islamic Messiah. Even until the consummation, and we'll show that that refers to the wedding feast, which is determined, is poured out upon the desolate. And we believe this refers to the cup judgments, which are poured out upon the desolate after trumpet seven. So jumping now to Daniel chapter 12, starting in verse 11, it says, and from the time the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, 1,290 days, and we'll show how this corresponds uh, to Jacob's trouble plus the time of the cups. And then it says, verse 12, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days which, as we'll see in this coming graphic, represents the wedding feast, which is Armageddon. So now this is the simplified version of the timeline with different, uh, different events filled in. So again, we have second line down, the seven seals that represents the, uh, the marshalling of the horse forces over some almost 2,000 years now. The seven trumpets, or the seven shofars, represents a seven-year period. The first four trumpets represent destruction by thirds. Uh, They're not woes. Trumpets five, six, and seven represent woes, meaning Yahweh is attempting. I realize my my picture is uh, obscuring the bottom left corner, but I wanted to leave this maximized just because there's so much information going on here. So the trumpets five, six, and seven represent the woes. We believe this is also when the seven thunders take place. So this represents the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, the three and a half years corresponds to 1,260 days, and then the seven cups will be poured out after trumpet seven. Now, we believe that the seven cups represent a period of 30 days. So you know how when you go to a fireworks display, whether it's an Independence Day celebration or what have you, uh, they start off slow, kind of like these seven seals start off slow. And then the momentum begins to build. Things begin to get stronger. And that's at the seven trumpets. So then at trumpet seven, that's when, when we go to a fireworks display. Then you have that final crescendo in the end. And the final, uh, the final they, they unleash everything they've got. And then sometimes they'll even save a second crescendo for an encore presentation effectively. And this is Armageddon. So the daily is taken away at the halfway mark during the seven-year tribulation. Then that leaves us 1,260 days until trumpet seven. Now we add to that the 30 days of the cup judgments, which are poured out upon the harlot Babylon. That makes 1,290 days. And then at this point, we know there's also at trumpet seven, there's also a beginning of the marshalling of the end time armies toward Armageddon. So if that takes place 75 days past trumpet seven, or if it takes place, which is also to say 45 days beyond the end of the cups, that brings us to the 1,335 days until Armageddon. And that's when Yeshua returns and that's the wedding feast. And that's why Daniel would say, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. So the urge or the impetus is going to be for us to want to go back home, uh, to be there in the land during this time of tribulation. There's a number of teachers teaching that we need to be in the land during this time of tribulation, uh, during Jacob's trouble and during the cups. But we read and we'll see as we go along, blessed is he who waits, who does not take part in the early in gathering and comes to the 1,335 days at Armageddon. We'll talk a lot more about that in, uh, in future slide sets. 
So now continuing on in Revelation chapter 11, which again is an inset chapter, but we're talking about the time prior to trumpet seven. And Yahweh says, and I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And we believe this corresponds to the 1,260 days of Jacob's trouble or the 42 months of Jacob's trouble. So again, uh, if you're one of the two witnesses and you're called to go back to the land of Israel, we would recommend that you go. If you are not one of the two witnesses and you are not called to go back to the land of Israel during that time frame, then we would say, blessed is he who waits or abstains and waits and comes to the 1,335 days of Armageddon. And we'll talk more about that in future slide sets. There's some things we don't have pinned down exactly, but we would recommend abstaining and not going back for the early in gathering, at least not at this point. Verse four, speaking of the two witnesses, he says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the Elohim of the earth. And one of the reasons we know that this is two individuals, sometimes people say, well, uh, the two witnesses, could this be the 144,000 or could this be the whole of the two houses? But we know that the two witnesses are going to die and then they're going to go up to heaven at trumpet seven. And if the two houses are killed, if Ephraim and Judah are killed and then they go up to heaven, then it's story over, end of story. Uh, there is no more book of Revelation, but we know that there's still events to be uh, to take place, still events to be carried out. So it can't be the two houses. It's probably not the 144,000, could possibly be the 144,000, but more than likely this is literally representing two individuals. And that fits with the narrative better as well. Verse five, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have the power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, and we'll see in future slide sets that that's a reference to Satan, will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of that great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Adon, or a master, was crucified, and we know that's Jerusalem. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And we believe that this is three and a half literal days because if we use the day for a year principle or a day for a thousand years, we go way outside the seven year time frame. Verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from Elohim entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the Elohim of heaven as people naturally would do uh, when a tenth of the city falls and two are raised from the dead. So then it says, verse 14, it says, the second woe is past. And we know the second woe is trumpet six. It says, behold, the third woe is coming quickly. And by this, we know that this takes place just prior to trumpet seven, which is the judgment of the harlot, opening the cup judgments, and then onward to Armageddon. So what we need to do at this point is we need to compare to Luke chapter 21. So in Luke chapter 21 and verse 20, Yeshua tells us, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, we're speaking of the time of Jacob's trouble, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. 
let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Now, one thing that's an important point, the focus of Revelation is on the land of Israel, and specifically on Jerusalem. That uh, doesn't mean the tribulation won't be a worldwide event. We believe it will spill over to the rest of the world, only that it'll be more intense in the land of Israel, specifically against Jerusalem. Verse 24, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And as we saw, that also corresponds to what we saw earlier in Revelation 11, verse 2, where we're told, and they will tread the set-apart city underfoot for 42 months, which is three and a half years. Now, one thing I would uh, just caution people, so Yeshua is not necessarily going chronologically here uh, like is happening in the timeline of Revelation. He's painting a picture uh, for his disciples. So continuing in verse 25, he says, And there will be signs in the sun, which we saw earlier uh, represents Christianity, and in the moon, as we saw, represents Judaism, because Judaism walks by the light of Torah, and in the stars could be representing Islam, because we know that uh, Abraham's seed were to be like the stars of the heaven and the sand of the seashore, which is neither numbered nor counted. It says, and on the earth distress of nations, which there would be, with perplexity, and the sea and the waves roaring. And we know that the sea can refer to people. So it continues in verse 26. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And again, the great shaking is going to take place at trumpet seven. So verse 27, he's referring to Armageddon. It says, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So once again, we know that the way we look at things is not the way that Elohim looks at things. So while this would be a time of extreme tribulation, extreme punishment, extreme persecution for mankind, we will be told to rejoice over these things because this is when Yahweh's people will be broken, for the remnant will be broken free from the Babylonian system. Please join me again for the next part and we will discuss the events at Trumpet 7 and the inset chapters that take place before Trumpet 7. Shalom.